So, welcome everybody to the meetup number 103 of the Dutch uh, Closure Meetup. We are here at Lunatech uh, and uh, we are here after I think five to six years since last time. Uh, beautiful office, beautiful city and we are going to have a beautiful agenda as well. We have two talks on the agenda. Uh, first one will be from uh, Christian from Germany uh, coming to talk about data hike and data log and queries. And the second one, uh, straight from South Korea, we're going to have Baruch to talk about, uh, uh, to talk with us about the StarCraft and uh, how to do closure stuff with it. So I'm going to give the stage to the first speaker now. Enjoy. I, um, I will talk about Data Hack today, uh, which is um, a recent project. First of all, I, I um, want to say that I have not gone through all the slides in one run, so I don't have like a fixed time budget. I can try to match any. I think I have 45 minutes officially. So, right, so um, I will try to stick to this, but um, yeah, I mean, if you have any kind of questions or interruptions, I think we are flexible enough probably to, to interrupt and I will directly answer because this is what I like about the meetup format that it's, it's fairly direct and, and open and it's way less formal than having like an official talk. In it. Okay, so first of all about me, I don't want, don't want to talk too much about me, but um, I've just uh, done my master thesis in, in machine learning um, and on computer vision tasks. Um, so I um, will pursue this. I was not sure about doing a PhD like a year ago, but um, it's pretty fascinating and I will work on the probabilistic programming language, Anglican, which um, happens to be in Clojure actually and it's pretty cool continuation passing style compiler and doing some interesting statistical stuff. Um, and this will be um, at UBC in Vancouver. So for me this will be like a big, big move in the next month um, going there. I have previously worked mostly in Clojure on the replicative libraries. Um, they are not crazily famous, but um, there are some useful things in there, I think, and it has proven an uh, interesting way to recombine them over the time from what I've learned to build database solutions. So this is not directly tied to the machine learning, except for the fact that I believe that um, you need to be able to manage large amounts of data and should like, have possibilities to deal with data to do analysis, like there is no good machine learning without good data collection and management. Um, I also do consulting. I've started a company with a friend, uh, which is called Lambda Forge. We are situated in Heidelberg. And yeah, it's, it's great fun. Actually, there is enough opportunity to do, or you can, if you are smart, you find a way to use closure and, and make money with that, which is, uh, which is great. I think this was not often the case for list programmers, that it was actually possible so I've heard this before in the discussions that um, in the beginning I think most people just did it out of enthusiasm, but I think it's very practical language and pragmatic um, environment. So first of all, this is the rough outline of the talk. Uh, I will give a brief motivation. Um, I think you will have, if you have used uh, the Atomic or a data log database, you might have other motivations and you know about this already. I will just tell about my angle um, to, to um, data hike, then I will talk about what data hike is in terms of prior work. So I will not go through all the details because this would obviously be too much for 45 minutes, I, I would say. And there is really good material and it's also not my work, so I would just like claiming to present something from people who have already partially presented it. I will talk a little bit about data log, but, but only briefly as like the general concept. And then I will try to give you a live coding example that we recently used this for invoicing. So I really like to take great ideas and use them for stupid simple problems because then you know that it's actually a good idea if it's also working in these small kind of, of, of setups. Um, so my motivation in the database space, I came um, or I'm, I'm coming from um, an eventually consistent or more precisely causally consistent context which is a system that allows multiple writers and does uh, and, um, conflict resolution um, on an object basis. So this is a conflict-free replicated data type um, or confluent or there are different um, variants for the C. And these are data types that basically allow you to edit the same piece of data in multiple places without coordination. Um, 
And you can imagine that this is useful in many cases if you want to do a sim more simple example is offline edits on a mobile phone. If you want to use it to directly, even if you are online but your connection is lossy or laggy or in any way, you can give the user a faster um, experience. So in this case you would do optimistic updates and things that are related and often can directly be translated in, in these kind of data types. So many of you will have just, even if you have never heard about this, I think some basics of it are intuitive. It's, it's, it's harder to get it right though. I mean, you often are making assumptions that then will not hold uh, if you try to do transactions, for instance, in your system and later on the system turns out to be in a different state or have been, has been in a different state. Um, the problem with CRDTs that I had, I have implemented them in, in Replicative, at least some of them, and have a, this has worked as a system where you could build front-end applications in React, React Native, um, you could also build a closure streaming solution where you could stream um, um, uh, for different types of data types, uh, for instance, a Git-like data type or a data type that has a map semantics that also allows removal of items uh, into, for instance, something like Datomic or some arbitrary backend database. So the idea was just to do the kind of write coordination and deal with the distributed part of the system but still give you like the normal databases and put them behind this kind of uh, right semantics, assuming that you then know how, what kind of restrictions you have I and mean, you cannot um, express everything. So there are still some burdens if you want to use this off-the-shelf database. But I don't want to talk about this here too much. I think the problem, or one problem for me conceptually, is that um, if you want to combine CRDTs, it's not intuitive how the conflict resolutions exactly compose and especially I, I'm working in Clojure and I worked in, with data log in the front end in form of data script and atomic in the back end and it's like a really superior form of technology I would argue compared to objects relational kind of mapping. So in this case you would have objects that are properly defined in a concurrent setting but you still have objects that you are com composing and that are all mutable, concurrently editable and that then can compose a more complicated application, um, but um, it's still not as declarative and easy to recompose them, for example, or, or re-aggregate them. So this is why I'm interested in data log because I think it's um, it's a better trade-off. And, and the most interesting uh, thing in um, following Rich Hickey, in a way, or it's like it's like better to constrain yourself. Um, so data log is a Turing incomplete language, so you deliberately uh, choose a language that's fitting for your data tasks um, and you hope that in the longer run you get a better um, trade-offs if you want to do the conflict resolution, for example. So this is something where I do not have an answer for yet, but I'm currently looking into this. So um, data hike itself does not um, solve the CRDT part, but I'm interested in, in data log because I want to go back to this, to this point. So this is really great to see on the Beamer, I think. Um, yeah, so I will just briefly describe data log. I don't know who of you knows data log in some form or another, like a third maybe. Okay, so um, data log is a subset of prolog, which is a logic programming language, which is um, basically you describe what you would like to have in a declarative way, and it's trying to find a solution. And what you all know is basically SQL that is doing the same thing. So you describe in this case, um, relations be, be uh, between um, typically a tabular structure um, and then <coughs> the query engine is figuring out an efficient way for you to retrieve this data. It's guaranteed to terminate and it has a well-defined semantics in the, in the sense that um, you can compose ex expressions of the language and it still yields you valid expressions. You can in theory do recursion in SQL um, but I think few people ever do because it's very elaborate and complicated and it's not, it's not a beautiful language to build complicated uh, um, uh, logic expressions. In. So the cool thing is that you um, do not see here, but I will, you will be able to see this later I think in Emacs, is that in data log itself you do an ex implicit joining which already eliminates a lot of the outer joins and where in kind of semantics in SQL is just a lot more terse. So what you should see here is I introduce a logic variable E that I'm already also querying but could also be implicit in the context and I'm just saying okay it should have the name attribute of this user 3 
299, uh, this will be from the later, ex uh, will, will um, pop up later again. Um, right, so I want to talk about um, data hike now, and data hike is nothing more than approximately, at least at the moment, uh, data script plus the hitchhiker tree. That's also where the name comes from. It's not really creative, but it was not taken, and it was in that sense at least exotic in a way. So, so yeah, it, uh, right. So, I mean, it was actually data hike itself. I knew that it was possible because I had a look at the data script code base, and I knew that the, the database interface was just in uh, B plus tree, and I, I knew that from last year working on the hitchhiker tree that is just a nice data structure that it basically provides the same kind of data structure, but I was not sure whether it's actually pluggable. So um, around Christmas or New Year, I sat down and just tried to hack it together as quickly as I could because I had few few amount of time, and then it figured out that I had one stupid bug that like totally killed the performance because I was linearly scanning the, the index all the time, and it took me like two weeks to figure out that I should have used a take take while and not a filter argument while scanning over the whole index. It was really like thought error uh, in, in a stupid way. But anyway, it turned out to be very well working. So the performance is nice. I will, I will, I will talk about this in a, in a moment. But first I will go um, over the two building blocks. So DataScript is, um, if you don't know it, who of you knows DataScript? Okay, so roughly the same kind of people who know data, data log. <laughs> um, yeah, so that data script is a really nice, compact implementation of the, the Tomic style data log in Clojure and Clojure script. So it runs both in your back end and in the front end, with the only um, caveat that it is only in memory. So whenever you have a data set that's too large or when you want to actually replay on the next session the same kind of data, you have to do the storage part yourself. Um, and you have to have the whole data set in memory all the time uh, to be able to query it, which is okay, I guess, for most simple use cases, or for many also non-trivial use cases, it has benefits to, to have this, but um, it's also obviously not, like, I would not consider this like a usable backend database, at least for, for my purposes. Uh, the convenience is not, not the same. So um, it's, it's very mature, so I didn't have to worry about a large test suite um, about a lot of users that have used it, tons of issues fixed. So I know that this part of the code base is safe. I just reused this and it's, I can just use these tests and that's what I did. I just changed the indexes at the same time. I had the new and the old index and was looking at the interface points where differences in the index behavior would, would show up um, with the new kind of index and fix them gradually until all tests would pass and I would not see any difference in the behavior of the index data structure. So it was fairly, fairly surgical way to be able to just fix these interfaces and not like had to deal, I don't even understand like all of DataScript's code base now, uh, even now. So I still want to go there, but it was not necessary and it was really a big relief and also a testament I think to the functional abstractions and the way that you can cleanly build uh, nice um, complicated systems in a functional language. Um, so yeah, the, the, the next property that's pretty interesting in our test is it has a faster in-memory at least query performance than Atomic. It's not crazily faster and it definitely will, it's like if, don't take this benchmark as any kind of serious, you know, I mean benchmark is really hard, but seeing it in simple benchmarks to perform that well is also motivating that this is a viable, um, a viable database uh, uh, um, approach from the beginning. Um, and it supports like a lot of the more elaborate datomic um, features, especially pull expressions, which are really handy and I will show them in the end. It also supports transactor functions, which can reject if the transaction does not fulfill the necessary invariance that you want to have in your data um, base. So they run basically in a transactional context and they are just a closure function. Uh, you can call them basically by extending the um, the, the language that the transactor understands and it calls your custom functions. So it's really flexible. All of this also runs completely in your in-memory context. So you can just call an arbitrary closure function in your query context. It's the same for Totomic uh, and for DataScript and it's really nice. So you can take another database if you like to and inside of your logic query you can join it with Totomic, which is, it's not using the same kind of index 
indexes, so it can get inefficient if you if you are if you're doing this manually because it then has to do scans and has to to, to, to realign this. So it depends on how you do it. I mean, it's not like a free 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 lunch thing, but um, it's really powerful. So I did this once, for example, to just access um, a training history of a machine learning model, which was many gigabytes of just floating point numbers bunched in a HDF5 file on disk. And then you can just, in the query engine, like ask that it would give you, or it could select like every 100th element in the language of the tensor database. So, you, I mean, I just mean it's like extremely flexible compared to, to SQL because it runs in your process, in your language, integrated on the client side and also the query in the Atomic. I, I won't go too much into the Atomic design, but I can really recommend looking into it because the query engine reading is completely decoupled from writing. So everybody can read um, and you will not block any kind of writer. Um, so it's really scalable, readable, uh, readable terms, a really scalable database. Um, okay, and the, the, the schemas, at least right now in data hack is the same. Um, the schemas in data script compared to the atomic do not have to be complete. So you do not have to list all the attributes that you're adding to the database and fully specify the schema but you have a more like NoSQL kind of thing where you could also just dump um, um, entities into the database at the price that you have a higher overhead of the attribute names. The, the storage of them is not just an integer or a, a long number, but it's a string of the attribute name. Okay, the hitchhiker tree. Um, who of you knows the B plus tree? Okay, so B plus three is a balanced data structure. That's like the, the best, provably the best um, data structure that you can use if you want to retrieve data um, from, from a storage medium because it's had logarithmic access. So it's branching on each level in a, in a, on, on some factor that's determining, determining your logarithm. And then you have to go a log n levels until you reach the leaf nodes of your, of your um, tree and um, this is, in a sense, optimal if you do not know anything more than the uniform, if you assume a uniform distribution of your, of your data points. If you know that you access them in, in many of them much more often, then in theory, that's also what you then practically do is you cache them and you try to introduce some additional, um, okay. yeah, you introduce basically caching. But um, yeah, that's in general purpose. And it, it combines the B plus tree with an append log inside of the tree structure. And I will show you a graphic of this in a moment. But the idea is that this um, allows you to choose for your particular application an optimal trade-off. So you can make the append lock part bigger or the balance tree part bigger, depending on whether you want to have better read performance or better write performance. Um, and then you go somewhere that's amortized, so it, it's not possible to have like exactly these O number, so I've, I've, I've cheated a little bit because I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go through the exact math to, to show this, but it's shown in the hitchhiker tree, at least like um, with examples, also not with the math, but um, I think there are some documents, or well, there's one document at least in the hitchhiker tree repository that um, goes into detail, in, into more detail. One point is that the hitchhiker tree itself is an implementation and at the same time the description of this data structure. So, so far at least, I have not seen this data structure. I mean, there are fractal trees and fractal data structures, but I think it's very specific and it's like an invention and a documentation of this implementation at the same time um, from, from David Greenberg. Actually, yes, he has done this and presented it at Strange Group. I have the link in the, in the final slides for the references. It also, that's just like for convenience, but it's really important that it supports batching. So you can just operate on it, operate on it, and then you flush it when you need it, and then only you will do the I.O. So if you are transacting you um, and you get a lot of pressure, you can um, bundle transactions and then flush them to disk uh, in, in aggregates, which um, allows you to go to the threshold where you are actually as fast as you can, can possibly write, even if the um, granularity of the transactions that are coming in is finer than, than, than what you be what is too fine and would not allow you to achieve this performance. So that's not implemented in data hack yet to exploit this. So I don't know if you can see this. I think can you can you can you see this? So this is okay. So so great. Like like the left side is one hitchhiker tree, 
where I have inserted the numbers um, actually from 1 to 9. I think there, is there a 0? No, there's no 0. I thought it would start with 0. But yeah, anyway, from, from 1 to 9, um, you can see this in the leaf nodes here. So you see that they are just sorted and, and, and um, there are some, it's, it, the inserts were shuffled to make it not trivial. I mean, if you insert in the sorted order, it's like, I mean, you, you, you will hit typical behavior of the tree and it will be boring. So in this case, to create some interesting structure, I've done this. So you see here that they, they are sorted. There is the five missing um, and the two is missing and the one is missing and they are still up there. And what you, hear, what you see here is the append log. This is like the same graph with visualization. I've just pre-coded this of the original um, presentation that David, uh, David Greenberg gave in, in at Strange Loop. He also used this. So this is the, the, what you see here is the append log. These are the range splits. So everything that's bigger than six uh, goes to right and everything smaller or equal to it will be in this segment. So you keep, like if you come down from somewhere and you want to know where you have to go further down, you basically walk down these uh, split um, markers in the, in the node and then you go to the next, um, to the next leaf node. This is like the P plus tree behavior. And here is, is um, the append log. Now, if I introduce into this, and these numbers, by the way, they are Merkle hashes. So the interesting property is it's a persistent data structure. So you can actually um, lay this out as an immutable addressable, content addressable data structure in an arbitrary distributed system um, and address it just by its Merkle, Merkle hashes. Um, and in, in, in this case, I've just introduced um, another 10 numbers. So the 19 is still up here. So we go till 18 here. And you see that um, I have a branching factor of, of, of three. So there has to be at least three um, on, on all the, in all the nodes, which is, is the case. Um, and in this case here, I'm doing st structural sharing. So this um, nine is still pointing to the same uh, root node. So this, although this, this is a new tree, you have the closure persistent data structure semantics on this and you have still the flushing. So 19 has only triggered the right event on the root node. It has not for inserting. It does not have to go all down there. So what it will do in inserts, it will just go into a node, look whether there is still space. So here I think it, the space for the append log is a free parameter, but is like three. If it's more than three, you will flush to the next level. And then what you're doing, so one open question that's also addressed in, 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 in the talk of, of, of David Greenberg, um, so you can also watch this. But one question that you have is, okay, but if I'm doing a query and I'm missing these append log items there, I mean, I have to project them back down to have the B plus tree kind of semantics. If, because if you, when you are writing, save the time and just write them in some node, then you have later, if you look up um, in some root node, you have to take them with you. And this is like the hitchhiking. So you take these guys that are standing there in these nodes still and are not, not really projected into the, the leaf nodes yet, you take them with you and then um, you are basically um, doing the hitchhike, hitchhiking in the hitchhiker tree. And that's, I think it's pretty amazing. I mean, I, 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 when I learned about the B plus tree, I was somehow like lazily assuming like this is optimal and that's what all the database people are doing. So that's what, was what I would have to do. And then amazingly, when I started to look into persistent, um, durable data structures, uh, David Greenberg came out with this and I thought like this is absolutely perfect. Um, because it's also, if you would, if you think about it, if you have a database, it's like you, you can do a lot of inserts just, normally you would have um, a log, an append log, just to keep all the data and then you would at a point later, push this append log into your B plus tree at some point. So you are not writing all the time to the tree because it's not fast enough and you want to capture the data and transact it when it's arriving in your system. And this data structure is naturally like solving this problem for you. So you don't have to do this additional transactor log, play, playback, coordination thing. All, all, these, all these parts are conveniently covered in, in, a, in a reasonable um, formalism. Um, yeah, so just, I, I, I promised this in the beginning. I've said it's a simple baseline benchmark, so it's not like I'm not claiming crazy like benchmark. Uh, it's not a sales pitch for, for the database. 
but um, it's interesting to see that, well, so I've uh, there are 100K entries in the database. It's not, not extremely much, but it's large enough to, to at least um, be of, of a reasonable size. And, oh yeah, I, I just have one query here. So this was from, from, from my colleague and a friend of mine who did the initial benchmarks in February when this worked. So this is basically running the same query that you've seen before, this find, uh, this, this atomic data log um, syntax. And um, it's running the same query with the criterion benchmark on three on the three um, databases that have a similar semantics like atomic data hike and data script. Um, so, and in this case, it was uh, data hike is like almost as fast as atomic. It's still a little bit slower, but I mean, it's without doing a ton of crazy optimizations. I mean, I've worked mostly on the data hike, uh, uh, sorry, on the hitchhiker tree um, uh, and, and tried to make it faster or figure out whether there are some problems in there, but I have not done anything um, too crazy yet. And data script, you can see, like, if you do it just in memory, it's B plus tree implementation is really fast, which is also okay in a sense because the atomic is doing a lot more. It's in connection management. You have to go through, talk to a transactor. I mean, it's, it's a big penalty on the, in the query part that you still have to pay, but I think, I mean, these are um, milliseconds for, well, I guess it was not this query. It was a more complicated query, so I'm sorry about this. It was, but this was the kind of benchmarking setup because for the, for the simpler queries, it's just like maybe a millisecond or, or two, or it's a really small number. So it's reasonable for a production environment. That's all what I want to say. It's like, is this, is this working? Okay. So finally, like a practical example. Okay. You would, you would in this case, um, just, um, import. So, so, so one thing that I, that I did to make it usable is I covered, the, the data script already covers a part of the Datomic API in JavaScript terms, so it has a transact function, it has a similar um, semantics, a query function, entity IDs, it's behaving very similarly, but it has not the durability back then. So I have basically created a new API namespace that is um, covering for convenience because we are at the company using Datomic in, in, in some consulting cases and have used it a few times, so it would be very reasonable if you had a similar API so you can just swap it in and out because this is a, a database that is still very young and it's very, you would not necessarily put it into a very serious environment and it's not replicated. You cannot talk to it over the network and so on. On the other hand, it's much easier. It's just a library that you load. You don't have to deploy it. You don't have license issues and so on. It's, it's, in a, it's, it's way leaner in, in, in its appeal. And it's also transparent. I mean, it's interesting for me to see what's going on in it. I cannot look into the atomic really, which personally I find I find sad <laughs> in a sense. I, I, yeah, I mean, it's like a re really interesting database, and you can I think you can do a lot more with this kind of technology than than what um, what the atomic is just doing. I mean, it's great what it's doing, but um, it's very focused on solving the um, the startup backend scalability issue, I would say, or big company backend scalability issue, but it's not really, f it can be recomposed in many ways. So anyway, I, we have a URI schema, which a scheme which is similar to the Atomic. It's very sim simple. So that at the moment there's a memory store, a backend, a file backend, and a level DB backend. Um, it would be totally reasonable and pretty amazing to integrate the Hitchhiker 3's Redis backend because this would allow you to write with memory speed and still have snapshots in a few seconds time because Redis can give this to you. You just have to be able to have enough memory for this um, in the case, but I think this would be cool, something that the Atomic itself cannot provide. Um, so I just would have to, it's maybe 50 lines of code or 20 lines of code, I know it's just adding, adding it. Um, so this is just um, the schema of, of, of uh, data script. So it's just the same API. In this case, I have not implemented uh, yet the Datomic type of schema, which is committed to the database itself. So a schema is data, and you can query it, and you can join it, and it's, it's pretty interesting. But here it's very simplistic. It's just this hash map. And you just um, describe the type of, uh, the, the part of the data that you are actually really interested in. So here we have, for this invoicing task that I was recently working on, we have something like task groups, which are subsections in a sense, um, each offer that can later be invoiced um, has several task groups. 
Um, and here you can see it's a reference type, um, which is helpful for the pull expressions that we will see in a moment. And then here um, you can do some um, identity um, declarations uh, where you say, okay, this is just a cardinality one. And then you can use this in a special syntax to reference uh, items if it's unique and it's a, 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 um, a qualifier for for um, for an entity then you can conveniently use it when you are transacting um, right and we have a customer name so I have just created a schema so here I can delete the old database and I will recreate it and then this is like the connection is actually just an atom that has a map in it. So one thing that's also can I can I think is nice is you can just look into this if you like to. It's fairly transparent. It's not perfectly implemented yet, but I mean it's more like an open source project. It's also not financed in any way so far. Um, so yeah, this is like if you transact, you basically just do an in-memory transaction on the um, on an atom. You, we lock on this, so in this scope, in this machine, it's safe to do this, um, and then we write and do the I/O in the lock scope. So you do not, you are not able to interleave with two write operations at the same time. Like a very sim simple implementation, but it does the trick. Um, right, and here we are adding two entities. These are two um, customers in this case. So I've just like made them up. Um, in this case, so these are just what you would expect to put in there somehow, some strings, some attributes. Um, and here you can see, if you don't know the atomic, this is the way to, to in your environment, declare um, a temporary unique identifier that you can use to reference to the same thing before you dispatch it to the database and it will give it an internal unique identifier. Because you're not working yet in a transactional context, it will have it will have to um, to resolve this later. Okay, so let's transact this. Okay, so this is just returning future. And then we can here um, retrieve again the entity IDs. And you see I'm, I'm querying for the logic variable E, which is um, represented by its ID. And for the um, customer name, which is ON, it doesn't make sense, it should be CN. Um, or it's like free to choose, and then uh, you get a set, a result set of your data. It's like really typical database kind of thing. Okay. So here I'm adding um, different items that I would like to invoice for. So they are um, different tasks where you would say, okay, I have a certain amount for, for, for a certain effort, I have an hourly price, I have a price unit, so you can be very declarative. You would like to have, at least we would like to have this in a database that we can easily use, and that in this case also not proprietary. Uh, so it's, it's, it's nice for, once that, for us that we um, just um, have this database available in this case and can keep the data. So we just add this basically as a, as a nested map, and then we can again Retrieve here, okay, we have now an offer with the ID 6 and the name adjustments in, in quarter 1, 2018. Um, we can also ask for the, uh, so here you can see for the first time a pull expression. So you can use this also in the query language itself and you can pull out um, from the task group everything that matches a certain, a certain task group name. So in this, in this uh, case, you are just by using the task group name attribute, you're just selecting task groups, so you automatically are pulling them out, and it's more a hash map-like feeling, which would be more, I guess, new SQL, uh, no SQL, or um, a document database like. Then, otherwise, you would, we would, I would have to write down um, for each attribute a query part, pull out each of the logic variables, and put them back into a map. Um, so this is just convenient that you can get it out again. So, and the cool thing is here I can do this um, nested. So I, I'm not even using data log right now, I'm just like recursively pulling out the nested data structure that I've just put, put in there. And I will now put this into, into, um, into a PDF. And this is not directly related, so you've seen, 
basically, if you have questions to data log, I mean, I can do more complicated things here. I can do plus uh, arithmetic, plus operations. I can do aggregates, like sum over all of this. I mean, it has like the typical, what you also have in SQL, the typical database functions, if, if, if you like to. And maybe I should, I mean, you can join um, over this by setting, saying, for instance, that, um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I could join, I, I don't have this here. I, let, me, let me show this to you if you're interested afterwards, because I don't want to, to go into too much detail. But um, it's obvious that you can add multiple clauses and it automatically joins. I don't know, who of you knows Selma? Okay, all right, great. Yeah, it's a nice templating language for, for Clojure um, um, that implements the Django uh, style templating. So I'm just setting it up here with some small, so it provides some functions. I'm translating basically the units out of the data structure into, into LaTeX because I happen to know it and it is, looks really beautiful if you do it right. It's just stupidly complicated if you don't know how to set it up. Um, but yeah, so I will, this is just set up here. Like what you would have to do, you can, you can test this. Like, okay, do I have the right kind of, in German it would be, you would need a um, semicolon there, uh, sorry, a comma there. And um, yeah. Okay, and then here, and this is like the main function, and then I'm done. Um, what, what I'm doing here is I want to render the PDF. So I want to call this um, with a client name, and it will then, with this first query function, it will get the entity ID of this customer. Um, then I will uh, reuse this um, later, I think, somewhere in the pull expression. Uh, yes, there, as client. Um, so, here, I will just fetch the whole, whole client information. I already get, I just um, ask for the offer ID, which is an integer anyway, and here I do this recursive pulling of the whole nested data structure, and I ask for everything. And then I'm doing outside of, of, of data script, because I personally, have, I've tried this a few times, but you do, you do not have to, or, or the, um, data log, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to calculate all the sums and aggregate values inside of data log because it's not, it's not that helpful for this task, but if I have this recursive nested, uh, uh, or if I have this tree-like nested data structure, then I can just use um, the specter library and transform this into, uh, so what I'm doing here is a sum for each, I, I multiply the effort with the effort price for each item, and then I do again a transformation in the next step and sum them up for each task group and then I sum them up for the whole document and then I have some taxing and then I put all this together and I call a Selma down here. So that's basically it. It's, I guess, fairly, it's a little bit long but it's just the typical stuff and then I, okay, I have this here and I can call this like this and then I get the Latish output from the shell which is not beautiful, but you can immediately see whether there is some error or not in the end. And then I have, so this is how we did it basically. In the, in the, in the company we were just doing pair programming, sitting in front of the Beamer, having the, the PDF open, and then looking at, at the output, and at the same time working on the REPL, which was a pretty nice experience. Um, and yeah, and that's like the, the, the final um, document. Um, a little bit reduced, and then you have invoices generated, and it's like this very simple workflow. There could be more fancy data log examples. I guess I could have come up with them, but I wanted to really do something that was practical for everyday use. Okay.